ready? Yep. So good morning everyone, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm a PhD student from Central Queensland University and the focus of my thesis is looking at track characteristics of um, cyclones along the east coast of Australia and seeing if we can find any environmental drivers or interesting things that we could use to like precursor these events for like forecast management and whatnot. And the two programs that I use mainly is MATLAB for my data organisation and then ArcGIS to help visualise um, what I'm actually looking at. So this, the two, ooh, yes. Um, so why are we, um, so why are we interested in doing this sort of research with cyclones is because there's two reasons. Essentially the damage that these storms cause to um, highly populated communities is quite um, immense and we need to be able to mitigate these damages a lot more. And they also provide a key water um, resource in recharging our freshwater catchments, which is important for like our daily use. So the two types of cyclones that I'm interested in is the tropical cyclone, which I'm sure all of you know about, and um, the east coast low. So tropical cyclones are our warm core systems. They usually occur above uh, five degrees south, um, and they do have that definitive eye for that cloud formation that you see um, in the middle. And then you do have our east coast low. So these are a little bit different. These are our cold core systems. They um, occur below 25 degrees south and they have an asymmetrical cloud formation, which is very important in regards to um, how they impact the land. So you can see, there's a, so you can, you can see here um, where the warm air and the cool air meet is, um, that's that asymmetrical cloud formation. So the study that I'm going to talk to you today is my recent study that's in review at the moment and essentially what, it, what it's about is it focused on comparing two databases of low pressure systems to see which one was superior for cycling research along the east coast. So the first database is called Matches and it's from the Bureau of Meteorology and it's their current east coast low database and it stands for Maps and Tables of Climate Hazards of the Eastern Seaboard. And then you have this new database called NSET1. Now, NSET1 comes from uh, PEPLA 2020, which is a recent study on low pressure systems. And it's based off the NSEPT NCAR reanalysis database um, for cyclone tracking. And the main aims that we wanted to do was see if we could identify East Coast low events in the NSET1 database and then see if the same East Coast low events were present in the matches database that were in the NSET1. And we did this through a range of spatial and temporal um, techniques. And then we wanted to see if the skill was similar or the same, um, was similar in the two databases and which one was more superior in creating track characteristics for notable East Coast low events. So to begin our study, we essentially wanted to, to compare apples with apples. So we created two subsets that followed the same filtering technique. So we had to make sure that our low pressure systems had a closed low. Um, they had to have a maximum Laplacian value of 0 0.25 or greater. So a Laplacian is a way to uh, measure intensity and is essentially the difference between the pressure of the inside and the outside of the centre of the, um, the storm. And then we also wanted to make sure that they were within the East Coast low box, which is a artificial um, box that you'll see on my next slide that they use to identify East Coast low events. And this just shows a couple of um, other factors. So both databases were from 1950 to 2019. Um, they were both created by PEPLA. And throughout the talk, the results are color-coded. So blue will, um, is related to the NSET1 database and the matches will be black result. So the first thing that we wanted to look at was the spatial extent of these two databases and we used a count raster function. And the first thing that um, you can see is that the NSET1 database is quite more spatially um, vast 
than the conservative matches. And it is in the, um, so like, the north, the, to the west, and to the south. The other thing to also note is that the um, higher density within the matches is quite higher than that of the end set, and it's to the end of the box as opposed to in the middle. But in the matches database, it is a bit artificial as you can actually pick up the um, grid lines that they used when they were tracking the uh, data. So the other um, interesting thing that we wanted to look at was seasonality. So this is a box plot to show um, the different, the median count of the different uh, months. And we performed a Wilcox um, rank sum test to see if it was significant. And our interesting result is that we were able to pick up that NSET 1 actually had more um, summer events than the matches database, which is very important because we are seeing that there are more uh, intense low pressure systems that are actually occurring in our summer months as opposed to um, the usual winter um, phenomenon. And you can see that um, here and here. Yeah. So then I, I wanted to have a look at um, to see what the tracks were actually doing. So this is a spaghetti plot and we essentially um, produced all these for the paired tracks and the little circles that you can see is where the track starts um, and we were able to compare these for the different months. So this is for summer and you can see that there's a very strong uh, tropical influence but the other thing to note is that the NSET 1 tracks were more extensive than the paired matches track for these tracks. We also looked at winter. Um, so this is an example of a winter month and you can see that the tracks are more westerly so these could be linked to our frontal systems that come across the bottom of Australia um, and move across South Australia to come along to the east coast. Again, um, the tracks are more extensive in NSET 1 and not the matches database. And then interestingly, we looked at the transition months. So this is an example from November, so this is spring. And our tracks are actually, they still have a westerly orientation, but they are coming from inland. So these can be connected to our inland trough systems, which is very important because we had a very intense storm in February 2020 that was actually um, backed from an inland trough system. Um, and it did quite a lot of damage, but because of how it formed, it wasn't actually classified um, as an East Coast low. And then we um, can look at notable East Coast low events. So these two are two East Coast low events that were very um, covered a lot in the media. So we have the 1998 yacht race, and then we have the Pasha Bolka storm. So the Pasha Bolka storm, the tracks kind of matched up really well in this East Coast low box. The only difference is one of them actually started on land and the other one um, didn't. And then the interesting case was the 1998 yacht race. So the parameters that I spoke about before is how we defined East Coast low in the East Coast low box wouldn't actually work in this case because the matches track doesn't actually have any points in the East Coast low box. It does kind of look, you can kind of, if you zoom in, they, they're not actually in the box. Um, whereas if we were to use the NSET 1 database, it is a little bit skew if, but the track is more extensive and we do have that one point which would classify it as an East Coast low, even though the amount of damage it did was um, not taken in consideration when doing this sort of filtering for data. So the summary of this specific study is that the NSET1 database was more superior in relation to track characteristics than the matches database. And this is because of the, extent, the extensive spatial range, track length and duration, but it also included summer and trough, summer lows and trough, inland trough systems, which is going to be important for our um, upcoming, upcoming storm seasons because we are seeing a lot more of these systems occur, especially on the East Coast. So essentially, who cares? Um, it is a database comparison. So the application of this work is essentially looking at 
how we can cluster these tracks to create pathways to get an idea of what's actually going on. So this is a, another study that I'm working on at the moment um, and it's looking at, uh, this is a linear regression model, so this is basically combining the latitude and longitude of tracks and putting them into groups to see um, if there's actually key pathways and then we can link environmental drivers to these pathways to see if we can actually identify what to look for in um, storm months or just throughout the year. And then this is uh, an example of what we can do. So this is uh, the tropical low cluster from the previous slide and you can see that we've got all of our, um, our tropical lows that are how they've spread out and then we can look at the temporal scale so we can see that these are tropical lows based on that they do occur in a lot of the warmer months um, and then we can also compare those to like the climate drivers so you've got your large scale climate drivers and um, so whether or not there was more during a La Nina phase or an IDO positive um, as opposed to whether or not they might have been influenced by the monsoon or the easterly trough system. And then we can also look at intensity. So uh, this is an intensity graph. So this is based on the Laplacian value and it's two days before intensity uh, it reached maximum intensity and two days after. So we can see that um, the average for the cluster that it had a really slow build, which is similar to what we see with our tropical cyclones, and then it had a very rapid decay, which is also very similar to if a tropical cyclone or cyclone event hits land, it decays quite quickly. But the exciting part is that we can look at rainfall. So this is a composite um, analysis of all the tracks for this specific cluster. So what we've done is we've taken the, um, this is silo data, so it's only daily, but we are working with, um, I am doing some investigation with sub daily at the moment. Um, and it's basically just taken rainfall slices and identified um, where the hot spots were for the most intense, the max rainfall for all the tracks of this specific cluster. And I think it's pretty cool. And we can use this for like hazard mapping in um, that sort of relationship. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. So I can. I'll show you another slide that I pre-prepared. <laughs> um, so this is essentially how the tracking toolbox works. So it's in MATLAB and basically you have your track and we align a 500 kilometer circle with each time step and just think of the rainfall, um, the rainfall data as like a cookie sheet. So we take a cookie cutter and we cut per time step and then we stack it so we have all of our different rainfall slices and then we create a composite and it highlights areas where there's max rainfall and areas where there's like little rainfall. That's what I'm trying to understand that. Yeah. Like all the tracks are in those stacks. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But um, because this is silo data, it, the silo data is only on land. Yeah, so because it's it's only on land, if the track didn't carry on land, then yeah. That makes sense. Yes, we are we are looking at um, so error five data and doing some experiments with trim data, which is also land and ocean. But we this this was just an example of what we can do with the cluster stuff. Yeah. Sorry to confuse you. Yes, yes. Yes. Intensity? Ah, uh, yes, so it was daily. So we um so we do have plots for this rain so for this um we are able to do max rainfall 
we are able to do the percentiles and the median and then the average as well. So we didn't really look at intensity as such. It was just to have a look at spatially where the rainfall kind of was distributed based on the cluster events. But I can take that back in. That's a very good point. Thank you. Yes. So, yes, yes and no. <laughs> um, economic impact is a little bit tricky in relation to this particular database. Because it is low pressure systems, you don't really find the data to go with it. Um, and we have tried to find sources of like different economic data that we can back with. Uh, that sort of research. Tropical cyclones or notable events that have names are obviously a lot easier because the media kind of picks it up and takes it and then you've actually got um, the different websites that obviously and the bureau that calculate the cost effective. Um, but yes, economic is something that I'm very interested in but it's very hard to find the data to actually represent what you want. So. Um, we haven't looked at insurance companies purely because, yeah, <laughs> it's like, what are you going to give me? And it's like, yeah, we, we, we did um, try a perils database, which is similar to insurance, but they, um, they don't actually have, their database that I thought was extensive is they pick and choose which um, actual events to cover. So I was kind of like, that's not really helpful in the case of hazard management. <laughs> so. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I wanted that Perils database. Is that like something to do with the metric system from um, the airline? Perils is a, it's a Swiss company and they look at insured losses um, for big big events um, so they've done they've done the big February so the February uh, cyclone that I talked about before they've done a big basic uh, report sorry words uh, report for that one and they did another tropical cyclone but they're based on economic insured losses and whatnot so they actually do have access to the data for that um, sort of stuff. Yes, they won't share it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. That's very, that's very helpful. Yes. That's similar to um, the tropical cyclone thing that for SES use, yeah. But a little bit different. <laughs> so, thank you. No worries. Broke it. <laughs> um, it will be Alistair Hart. 
So we can there. just stay there. <laughs> um, yep. So we have Alistair Hart up now. Um, for anyone who missed the introduction yesterday, managing director for the conglomerate of overarching farm doctors, mangoes mapping and map gear, involved with fungus and spatial scene for at least 20 years. Um, and he gave a talk yesterday on RTK GNSS for precise machine guidance for planting strawberries. And today's theme is on LiDAR, the difference between digital and old school LiDAR. What is the point? I will tell us more. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> so it's actually um, a little timely because this year is the 10th anniversary of the establishment of the LiDAR Technologies Workshop um, event series. Hands up if you went to any of the LiDAR technology workshops. One, two, three, four, five, yep, six. Cool. So there were a few people. We ran that over three years for fungus from 2011 to 2013. Um, hopefully something will happen soon. I might just have to log in. Um, as always, I promise to get you out of here on time and no earlier. Uh, do my computer must have auto locked when I closed the lid. Why do I use such a long network password? All right, great glasses, must see. So today, yeah, well, I'm, I want to talk to you guys. I'm passionate about lidar, which led to me establishing that lidar technologies workshop thing ten long years ago, and um, I learned about digital lidar two to three years ago when I went to an international conference in, in Germany. And it, it really captured my imagination. So I'll try and share what I understand of that with you guys today. Um, so you guys, are, ha, who's heard of LiDAR? Let's start with that. Everyone? Excellent. Anyone um, game enough to put their hand up and declare that they're not yet sure what LiDAR means? OK. So have you heard of radar or sonar? Right, so radar, radio waves, you know, detection and ranging, LIDAR is light detection and ranging. So it's using active light, laser sources, to blast out lasers and to measure the reflection of those lasers and that time of flight and knowing the location from which the laser was generated and, and the direction in which the laser was pointed allows you to compute the three-dimensional location of the point that's been reflected back. And because light's pretty hard to compress, you get fairly precise images back. And, and many of you will be aware that LiDAR has been used in um, topographic mapping. Um, there are a number of other applications for it that you can start to see here. Some of the ones that have taken me by surprise are um, security monitoring and intelligent transport systems. Um, so, you know, does it hint at our dystopian future? Perhaps. Um, the nice thing about it, though, is that it's de-identified. So they might know where someone is, but they may not know who that someone is. Um, and then there's all sorts of applications around autonomous navigation uh, and, and stacks of uh, industrial applications like, you know, automated warehouses and that sort of thing. So we'll, we'll take a look at a couple of those specific use cases later on. They're not unique to digital LiDAR, um, but there are some aspects of digital LiDAR that um, make LiDAR generally as a technology platform more accessible for those applications. So if we start to explore that in this graph here, the graph itself shows the expansion of the camera market um, over the last 36 years, right? And you can see that it was sort of like chugging along at, you know, 30 million units a year, which in itself is notable. Um, and then it was, you know, disrupted as, as digital cameras became a real thing. And there was just this epic market expansion. You know, we all know the story about Kodak got left behind. They didn't see it coming and all of that. And... That's what we're sort of anticipating for LiDAR as well. We've had this analogue LiDAR, and I'll go into the mechanics of analogue versus digital LiDAR in a little bit, but we're expecting that we will see the same sort of transformation of um, financial accessibility and, and size and power consumption and all of those limiting factors um, over the next decade, basically, that will lead LiDAR to a 300 times market expansion um, over a 10-year period from 2020 to 2030. So how on earth can we consume 300 million LiDAR units a year around the world, right? It's a pretty insane... I'm still, to be honest, struggling with the concept that every year we're consuming 7 billion RGB sensors. Um, but we are. I guess there's, you know, every phone now has like three in them or something. 
Um, so, you know, we'll get there. Um, so, in America alone, in uh, 2030, um, Auster, which is a brand of LiDAR that I'm just declaring this, you know, very obvious uh, conflict of interest that we distribute uh, into Australia and New Zealand, uh, and it is um, one of the few LiDAR, digital LiDAR companies on the market. Um, so, they anticipate that the American market uh, alone will consume, you know, um, a rather large amount of um, sensors in these different domains. So industrial, that's, you know, your, your warehouse, um, uh, smart infrastructure, that's the security and intelligent transport system stuff that we're talking about. Imagine if you, you walk up to a, a street intersection and it's already, it's seen you coming from half a block away and it knows from how you stand and where you stand where you want to navigate based on machine learning and classification of the behaviour of all the other pedestrians that have come before you. So you no longer even have to press the button, just based on where you stand and how you stand, it'll know um, which side of the street you want to cross and it will um, proactively manage the flow of the traffic lights to accommodate that. So when we talk about, you know, Internet of Things and we start to gang up our transport system control devices like intersection controls with traffic lights and pedestrian crossings and all of that, we can actually achieve some real economies of scale. Um, and drive um, efficiencies and safety improvements in deconflicting um, um, pedestrian and cyclist movements with, with vehicles as well. So overall, it's just this whole new thing that will start to, um, you know, open up new frontiers for us to think about. So I'll just run you through some of the fundamental differences now between analogue and digital LiDAR. So on the left, we've got a drawing um, of an analogue LiDAR. And one of, it's kind of, I'll, I'll okay. And, and what you can see is that there's these stacks of um, arrays. So on the uh, right-hand side of that drawing, we've got all the laser arrays. And every little um, PCB, printed circuit board, contains one laser emitter and the associated bits of hardware that are required to generate that laser emitter and encoder. And then on the other side, you've got the receivers and there's a corresponding board for every individual LiDAR channel. So, you know, when we started to hear about the Velodyne 16 channel LiDAR parks, it's like, oh, that's pretty good. You know, we're up from eight. And then they brought out the 32s and then the 64s. The challenge with that is that with every extra channel, you've got to put on an extra um, set of, of um, boards on each side of that stack. And then they're all very carefully and laboriously, those lasers are all aligned and then glued and screwed into that housing. And the challenge with that is that um, it's, it's large, it's heavy, it consumes a lot of power and uh, over time, through the vibration that is inevitable through the application of this sensor on stuff that moves around, those lasers gradually move out of alignment again. And, you know, 0.5 of a degree doesn't sound like a lot at the point of origin, but if that's amplified over 100 metres, for any people that have got a history in doing survey work or, you know, um, um, bearing and, and distance sort of calculations, um, over that, you know, flight distance of 100 metres, that 0.5 degrees becomes really consequential in the spatial definition of where an object is. So what that means is that with analogue LiDAR, um, they do have to go off and get recalibrated and they usually have to go back to their manufacturers. It costs several thousand US dollars and it means that you've got to take that sensor out of whatever bit of equipment you've got uh, using it, send it overseas and, and, and have like six weeks downtime and cost several thousand bucks to get it recalibrated. And then you've got to do that every year or two. So um, that in itself is a limiting factor to the application of LiDAR. On the right hand side we've got an example of digital LiDAR and this same, by the way, this exact same tech stack is in the you know, iPhone 12 Pros and forward that have the LiDAR. Hands up, who's got an iPhone with a LiDAR in it? No one? Not even me, I'll put my hand down. Um, so, you know, the new um, iPhone 12 Pros, etc., all, all come with this form of LiDAR. So Apple and Auster are the only two companies in the world um, producing this uh, LiDAR. Apple consumer grade, Auster industrial grade. They're using the same technology. So they're using, basically, it's, it's the same sort of sensor that you have, like a CMOS sensor that you have in an SLR camera. So it's, it's receiving, um, you know, data and it's receiving it uh, at very high resolution. So it's a very sensitive um, sensor and it replaces all of those receiver boards on the right-hand side and it's a single, kind of like a single chip. 
And then you have your um, vertical, vertical cavity surface array, um, surface emitting LiDAR, which is basically a small chip in itself with a bunch of holes in it. And the LiDAR gets um, punched out through those holes. And it's punched out and then the micro optics. So Apple and Samsung um, have spent a lot of money on the lenses that are in your cameras. You wouldn't think that such a small bit of glass could have so much technology in it, but there's been a, an amazing amount, like millions and millions and millions of dollars of R&D have gone into optimising the performance of these micro-optical devices that are embedded in our phones, right? And so what Alster have done, if that, they've gone to the manufacturer that Apple used for their phones and said, we want you to build us a, a you know, micro-optic array that supports the um, expansion of this technology into an industrial context. So we want micro-optics that allow us to shoot a LiDAR point cloud, not five metres, but, you know, 200 metres down the road. Um, and so there's these three fundamental components, and we'll break those down in a drawing in a little bit. If we take a look at the physical objects and how they compare, you can see the digital LiDAR on the left and the um, analogue LiDAR, LiDAR on the, the right. So this looks like a lot of hardware. That's just a 16-channel... Um, LiDAR array on the right. There's 16 individual laser emitters and 16 different receivers, and, you know, stacked down below the, the ring here. And then they're all sort of glued and screwed and shrunk, shrunk wrapped in. They try and lock it in as hard as they can, but inevitably there ends up being a bit of movement in there. And on the right is an Ouster LiDAR device, and that um, can have anything up to, 100, at this point in time, 128 channels, so eight times the channel count in a device that's half the size, half the weight, half the power consumption and a fraction of the cost. So it's like a completely disruptive. This is the analogue to digital disruption of LiDAR in, in, in play. Um, and I'm very excited about it. Yeah. So did anyone suffer from, like, removed components? Oh. No. No, it's, 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 it's baked in. Like... There's no capacity for future realignment of the product. It, it is, the way it's manufactured, it can't go out of alignment. In fact, once the units are manufactured, you have to get a hacksaw out to, to hacksaw the lens in half to get into them. Um, I think there's a slide that shows, not actual hacksawing, but, you know, explains that. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a good question, though, and we'll take a little bit of a closer look at some of this architecture, but, yeah, it's, that's why I, I love it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is the front view. Um, again, it's just showing you the difference in the micro optics versus the traditional optics that are used in the larger um, sensors that are, you know, the current status quo in the marketplace. Um, uh, this is uh, a breakdown. So this is where we talk about, you know, it's inherently it can't go out of alignment. So the whole thing. And then you've got the custom lenses, which so you can insert different lenses to manage the way that those lasers are distributed. So you can, it's like you can have different lenses in your compound microscope that allow you to see something at 10 times or 100 times. And we, we, we might even talk about that a bit more too. There's a few slides. We'll get you to morning tea on time though. Um, so we talked about the complexity of analog LiDAR. I don't really want to bang on about it. There's a couple of cool videos I also want to show you. But the fundamentals are that there's, there's like a physical limit to the amount of these things that you can stack together and have spinning around um, and um, collecting data. And it's kind of, it, it's maxed out. Like we've kind of got, we've taken that pretty much as far as we can effectively take it. Now we're into like law of diminishing returns in terms of, you know, stacking more sensors on sensors and, and then you just get more pucks and, you know, like multiply the number of pucks that you've got on your platform and all of that sort of stuff to, to scale up. And all of that just adds complexity and cost and vulnerability. And if we take a, a deeper look at it, this is what I'm talking about, every individual board. So we've got our um, laser emitters and receivers and, and every time you add a new channel, you're adding a new board on each side. Um, if we 
um, take a look at how that operates. So this is a, a visualisation of all of those stacked um, um, edge emitting laser diodes. And, and look, they've actually got some good benefits. You know, it's not all bad news. So the existing technology, they're, they're relatively powerful lasers compared to the new um, Vexel laser format. Um, so they can throw that laser further without needing to invest in, you know, high quality um, optical um, devices to amplify the light. Um, and, you know, they're moderately affordable. Um, like I said, though, we're just sort of starting to hit, our, hit, hit the ceiling on, on scalability um, with those products. If we compare that to how the um, digital LiDAR behaves, it basically just has this chip with a stack of um, um, surface cavities in it, and each of those surface cavities emits a single channel of LiDAR. So currently they're at 128. Two years ago they were at 32. Um, they think that they'll be at 256 channels within a couple of years, and maybe within four years we could be looking at 1,280 channel LiDAR sensors, which is just pretty mind-blowing when you think about it, like the amount of data that we can start to uh, collect. <laughs> so, like, again, I'm really excited by this. Um, and, and I just, like, you know... I have a lot of lying in bed awake at night and it's not all bad, you know, some of it's just thinking about, you know, what the, what the possibilities are with this technology, where we can go. Um, so spinning LiDAR is really, you know, what we've been focused on, the, you know, like it, most people would be familiar with, you know, brands like Velodyne, that's probably the most commonly uh, understood brand in the marketplace of, of little spinning LiDAR pucks, you know, these, these jobbies. And um, there are other forms of LiDAR on the market as well. Um, so there's a rotating um, mirror and a little MEMS mirror um, LiDAR platforms, but um, they uh, equally all have limitations that lead to digital spinning LiDAR being a very effective um, form of LiDAR collection. So this isn't exclusive to... Um, Digital, it, these benefits um, apply to analog spinning LiDAR as well, um, but because it, yeah, I won't talk about manufacturers or slides. And, um, so one of the really interesting differentiators is um, that with this digital LiDAR, when, and it's, it's a shame I don't have in this particular pitch deck a slide that shows how it works, but basically, it's operating at um, 850 nanometers, which I think is like near infrared. Any remote sensing gurus in the room? Yes, there are. <laughs> I'm looking up the back. I thought you did, bro. Anyway, okay. Um, so um, a lot of LiDAR runs at 905 nanometers and at about, I think, 1500 nanometers. And running at 855 nanometers, I think it's 855, 865, brings it back down to sort of like near infrared um, and it's very close to visible light. And um, digital LiDAR doesn't just, you know, measure the waveform that comes back and collects the peak of that and says, okay, well, in the peak of that, based on that timing, we now have, you know, a, a discrete object. You probably know a lot about this stuff. Um, um, what it's doing, it's, it's also collecting all of the ambient data, so it measures all of the photons that are coming back, all of the light that is coming in. So not just the active light from the laser, but also the ambient light, the, you know, just solar uh, radiation um, that's bouncing off stuff. And so you can see that ambient sort of sunlight um, visualisation up the top, and then you've got the intensity of the LiDAR return. And then this down the bottom here, I think it's thematically mapped by distance or something. Um, but what we actually get is basically an image plus a point cloud all at the same time. And they're inherently aligned. So because the same um, channels are collecting that data, um, you, you, your ambient data as are collecting that, the active data, you get perfect alignment. Like It's almost like taking a photo that has depth data in it. So you get the photo, but you also get the you know, the Z, if you like, the distance from the sensor um, of that object. Um, yeah, it is pretty cool. And if we take a look at um, this a little bit further, um, the, it also lends itself to perfectly structured points. So when you've got this chip blasting away in sequence with 128 channels all firing simultaneously, you end up with very repeatable digital data. So 
the data itself is all beautifully structured and, and everything ties together and it allows you to do like um, real time um, 2D and 3D analysis and consuming the, you know, the ambient data and the, the three dimensional you know, point cloud data all simultaneously in the machine in real time. So there's a lot of productivity gains there that I'm not really um, fully able to articulate, to be perfectly honest, at this point in time. Um, but I'm working on it. Um, so this is really just a, a, a zoomed in view of what we were talking about before, where you can um, take that, that three dimensional you know, picture and view it in a 2D environment and do data labeling, so semantic classification of your environment, differentiation of roads, pedestrians, cars, buildings, in real time, um, very efficiently. So it reduces the computational requirement, it increases the speed, and it lends itself to um, um, machine learning. So we've got a number of customers here in Australia that are actively investigating the opportunities to apply this technology in that context. Um, in, in industrial survey um, insurance, and um, defence domains, uh, so they're all looking at this, um, and and you know because of the machine learning um, efficiencies, it really does lend itself to autonomous navigation as well. So we'll take a, a closer look at that, time permitting. Um, radio. Okay. So I talked about the imaging. That's the sort of image that you get. It's not an RGB image. It's not an RGB sensor, um, but that's the ambient light coming back through the sensor. So it's a pretty high-res image, really, considering the technology that you're dealing with. Now, I talked about Apple using this technology as well. So Alster were actually using it prior to Apple. Um, it's great that Apple have also come on board and adopted that same um, methodology because it will lend itself to increased growth, growth. So the limitations of LiDAR at this point in time is it's a relative digital LiDAR. This, this particular format of digital LiDAR is relatively immature and there's not a lot of demand in the market. So, you know, we don't have the industrial weight of the world being thrown at how do we make this stuff better and more efficient. But that's coming, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But what I'm really showing you here is the density of the data that's being generated on an iPad Pro versus an Alster LiDAR sensor. So there's like an awful lot of LiDAR um, um, points being generated out of these Auster sensors. So the 128 channel sensors generate 2.6 million points per second or up to that many. So that it's all configurable. You can set your drivers and tell it, you know, how many hertz and how many channel sectors and whatever else. Um, but yeah, up to 2.6 million um, points per second. And just a couple of weeks ago, Auster released their first multi-channel LiDAR sensor that effectively doubles that um, point count up to 5.2 million points per second. And back in 2012, I think, we were doing some um, testing of mobile terrestrial LiDAR scanners on the Tablelands for Tablelands Regional Council to look at um, proactive mapping of the road network and, you know, improve productivity in um, defect mapping post-disaster. Um, the, 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 the just briefly, the backstory to that was that over three years, that averaged each year uh, 100 million a year in um, um, road defects that um, were claimed under the NDRRA. Um, so there's five and a half thousand kilometre road network up on the tablelands. It's about 50 50 dirt and bitumen, and it all gets smashed around uh, in major um, monsoonal events and cyclones. And I went to the CEO because it was taken, they'd put guys out in utes with digital cameras, digital GPS cameras and, and you know, um, do data collection and Bob knows more about this than I do. Um, but my recollection was that you might have like, you know, three utes go out for eight months trying to document defects. Does that sound about right? Um, yeah, o over the TRC, the, the, in the old days, so when we're all friends. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I went to the CEO and I said, so what, what percentage of the defects do you reckon you're actually ma mapping, you know, or, or more specifically, what percentage of the defects that are eligible for restoration under NDRRA do you think you're missing? And he was like, oh, I don't know, 
Like, it's hard to say, like, you know, because you're going to focus on the big ones and there's going to be a lot of little ones that are eligible for restoration, but you lack the capacity to, to actually document them all and process them and get them reconstructed within that three-year window. So you let them slip through the net. And I said, well, like, let's just say it's only 5%. Then really what you're saying is that you're satisfied to accrue a $5 million, you know, depreciation in your asset network simply because you don't have the capacity to collect um, and document the defects associated with this road network. Uh, and over three years, that's a $15 million, you know, depreciation in your road network that you're only wearing through a lack of technology, not because the money's not there. The money's there from the state and the feds. You just need to be able to document those defects so you can um, log them and, and get them reconstructed. And so they let me um, do a little more research on this and I nicked off to the states for a week and um, went through the manufacturing facilities of um, Topcon's LiDAR factory. They produce the IPS2 um, payload that's been used a lot by Google for their street view mapping. And I met with the leading American Department of Transport on mobile terrestrial LiDAR scanners and the researchers from UC Davis that um, informed their approach and participated in the International LiDAR Mapping Forum. And um, out of all of that, we ended up getting the two leading mobile terrestrial LiDAR scanning platforms in the world back onto the tablelands to do some road testing in unsealed and sealed roads and in areas of extended closed canopy where they were denied, um, you know, RTK um, GNSS or decent GNSS full stop to really test the, the IMU um, or INS components of those platforms. So we, we tested the um, Regal VMX450 dual head um, scanner and the Optech, I think it was the 600. Um, and they both sat at about 1.2 1, 1 million points per second. Um, and just out of curiosity, when we, we put in digital level control on average every 86 metres along the eight kilometres of, of test road that we used in different patches around the joint, you know, we got amazing data out of it. On average, I think it was about 2.3 millimetres um, variation between the um, targets and, and, you know, what was observed in the point cloud. So it was very tight LiDAR. And you don't see that same level of tightness at this point in time with the evolution of this LiDAR. There's still more ranging error, I suppose you'd call it, uh, in this LiDAR, but it's still very powerful. Um, but anyway, that's a really long way of saying that like eight years ago, nine years ago, we were excited by a million points per second and that was coming out of two sensors. So each sensor was capable of, you know, 550,000 for Regal, I believe, and 500,000 points per second. Um, uh, having said that, you could co collect up to like five returns per pulse and, you know, I, I really do love that gear. I hope you're not watching this, Asta. Um, right, okay, moving right along. So just, um, as a successor, though, one, one um, road that was considerably damaged, a gravel road, yeah. ended up being fixed on this result. That was Upper Barron Road, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, we got some great three-dimensional data of potholes and corrugations in, in gravel roads out of this um, mobile terrestrial LiDAR scanning trials. Uh, and it was actually really cool because there was a stormwater inlet collection pit at the junction of these two dirt roads. And as it drove past, it mapped pretty much 50% of the pit as well. It got, you know, the base of the pit and, and the back wall and half of the side walls and the grate across the top of it. It's, it's quite amazing what's capable of being delivered out of these LiDAR sensors. Yeah. So I was just talking about the evolution of the hardware and, um, you know, we... We really, at early stages, I think, Bob, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you might have been talking about Moore's Law in the context of GIS and computing power and, you know, where we can take um, GIS and, and all of that. And, and what we're seeing now with digital LiDAR is it's still relatively immature and we're still really at the beginning of the um, capability development of, of the, you know, the Moore's Law curve in terms of the um, development of the capability of this. I've already hinted at that in terms of this 10xing of channel count over the next four years. Um, we've already seen that slide and that one and that one and that one. Well, we're going to save a bit of time here and that one. <laughs> That's good because I've got some videos I want to show you anyway. Um, anyway, the other inherent thing about this LiDAR is because we don't have all of those, you know, boards stacked on each other, you can literally shake the living daylights out of this stuff and it's quite resilient. So it's rated to IP69K for vibration and the previous generation devices were rated to IP68 for water. I think the new ones may have a higher rating. Are you guys familiar with IP ratings? Yep, great. 
So we won't go into that too much. But anyway, it's tough. It's damn tough. Check it out. You can leave it on the roof and go through a car wash. I think that's pretty cool. All right. Um, you know about IP rating. We won't talk about that. Um, it works really well in rain. Has anyone ever wondered how LiDAR goes in rain? Um, at the 950 nanometer um, um, frequency, the, some of the LiDARs do have a lot of trouble with water. And what we're finding is that the, uh, sorry, at 905, and um, at the frequency at the ousters that operate at, we actually still get quite good um, information out of the uh, sensor in very wet conditions. Um, yeah, this is just where I was talking about you've got to hacksaw it in half to, to if you actually want to service the device, you can't, you can't actually open it up once it's, it's been built. Um, uh, you just that black lens in the middle, you basically just um, yeah, have to cut that in half if you want to have a closer look at it. Um, works in the snow, not particularly applicable to us. Um, it, it handles hot to cold and cold to hot shock pretty well. So if you wanted to um, take it out of an air-conditioned room and stick it in a hot, humid environment, you don't have to worry about condensation on the inside of it. Um, that's kind of handy. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, devices that focus on the field of view and the range. And if anyone wants to know more about that, come and have a chat to me later. Um, and you can get um, beam configuration. So there's just a uniform, just, you know, vomit the, the data out or focus it into specific areas of... Um, uh, of interest or have a gradient where most of the channel count is focused towards the, you know, um, zero degrees um, offset. Um, the ultra wide view short range stuff is really great for um, uh, short range um, understanding of what, what's around you and it allows that 95 degree field of view allows you to really get a good understanding of what's below you and uh, above you as well. The mid range stuff focuses it in and pushes the sensor out further. And often you'll see a combination of that short and mid-range sensor being used in autonomous navigation. So you've got the, you know, um, good understanding of what's around you, but you've also got forward notice of what's coming towards you. And then there's a very long-range LiDAR. So this very long-range long, long range LiDAR has actually been adopted by an Australian company to incorporate into a, a train, a railway defect, sort of some sort of um, railway condition assessment uh, solution, and it's just mounted on the trains. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time looking at this, but basically it shows you with the different devices, you know, um, what they look like at um, different um, uh, distances. So this is the um, OS2, which is the um, long range uh, LiDAR, and you've got 32, 64 and 128 channel counts and, and how they differ in their differentiation of objects. And the OS1 and the OSO, the very short, short range. So you get super high density up close with the OSO 128. Um, if anyone wants to have a play with these, we actually do have um, demo hardware here in Australia that Mango's mapping own, um, including an OSO 128. I actually just kind of ran out of time. Those who were here yesterday knew that I was up until 1.30 doing my talks. So I didn't take the time to reef out of the office all of the gear to allow me to set one of these up in the corner and just have a real-time 3D view of the room, I was going to do that. We, we, I'll do that some other time. We'll set it up at a pub sometime. Um, that's just a, a point cloud um, showing the uh, colourised by range. But what I want to really do is to just give you a better understanding of how we get to 300 million LiDAR sensors in nine years' time. And um, it's really, you know, some of these devices will need more than one. So if you take a look at a, um, an automated factory vehicle, it's potentially going to use up to six devices just on one um, factory vehicle. But because they're small and light and compact and relatively cheap and continuing to get cheaper, so Alster halved the price on some of their products um, in earlier this year, I think. They just went, oh, yeah, by the way, we're now making our, you know, 32-channel LiDAR the same price as our old 16-channel LiDAR, and we, we can't be bothered making the 16-channel LiDAR anymore. Um, so we will see, you know, that, that financial accessibility for this stuff continue. So some other examples of where you're going to consume a bunch. Obviously with a drone, you're just going to stick one on it and go and do your topo surveys. Um, with, um, you know, delivery vehicles, getting your shopping and your hot pizzas to you. Um, again, they're potentially going to be using up to five devices. And there are plenty of real world applications that already exist. Um, 
in the automation of um, heavy machinery in the mining sector, um, robotic lawnmowers. Who wouldn't like one of those up here in the tropics? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I hope to have a demo one. <laughs> I just need to buy a bigger place so I can legitimise it. Currently, the chooks pretty much destroy the lawn at home, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, here's some interesting um, smaller robotic applications. Um, the one in the middle up the top, I believe, is an automated um, disinfection machine that was developed last year at the beginning of the pandemic to cruise around areas of China and just disinfect you know, the environment without needing people to operate it. Um, that's kind of interesting. There's some of the automated um, forklifts and platform delivery things for, for warehousing. And then, of course, we get into um, autonomous transport and autonomous um, farming as well. So you can actually have the tractor go out and do the spraying at night without having anyone in it. And, and there are conversations occurring within Queensland on that domain as well. All right, great. Um, drones, plenty of applications in drones, but what I really want to do is the good stuff. And let's see if we can play you. I'm actually going to skip this video, even though it's filmed in the Netherlands. It's about using um, drones. This is a, a demo with an A330, but it's in a um, defence airport, and they're looking at um, automating the inspection of defence aircraft assets. Um, uh, that's still that one. Let's just keep moving. Um, this is, I like this one. Oh, do I need to put in the 3.5 mil audio? Probably. Hope we don't hurt anyone's ears. No, we made it. And just make sure we've got audio. That's, oops. Oh, have I? Oh, yes. Sorry, let me just see if I can change that. Okay, let's try that again. Our computers, second is deep learning, and the thir third is high resolution LiDAR. PLUS is applying level four autonomous driving technology to trucking today. Trucking is a really interesting use case because trucks are really big. Trucks do a lot of work. You can increase the utilization of a truck to 24 hours if you can automate it. We're With deploying our system in the US, China, and US. Europe at large volume. We'll have thousands of trucks on the road by the end of this year and tens of thousands of trucks by the end of next year. So we need partners that are ready to scale with us. Auster is absolutely ready to scale. They are able to manufacture these sensors with high reliability and all the features we want at production volumes with production pricing. One thing that many people don't realize about trucks is just how big they really are. You can hide a car next to a truck and it's very hard for the driver to see it. The reason LiDAR is so important for autonomous driving is because it tells you the occupancy of space, a very simple direct measure of whether you can drive there or not. When driving a truck at highway speeds, if there's something very far down the road, you still have some time to react to it. But if there's something close to you, you have to react instantly. That's why we try to keep a cocoon of perfect perception directly next to the truck. And that's why the Auster LiDAR is a key ingredient in our system. The wide field of view and the broad opening angle on the OS1 sensor is an absolutely perfect fit for our trucking system. It makes it possible for us to have zero blind spots anywhere. The high resolution of the Auster LiDAR is absolutely critical for our perception system. When it comes to LiDAR, there is no range without sufficient resolution. Our system needs to be able to make decisions based on the sensor data that it's getting. The more points we can get on an object, the more confidence we have, the effective range of the Auster sensor is best in class. We don't put LiDAR on the truck just because it's cool. We put LiDAR on the truck because we can't afford to make any errors in perception. We need our system to be absolutely perfect. Alistair has put LiDAR on a chip, and they can actually take advantage of Moore's Law. They're shrinking the components, and they're doubling the performance every year. At PLUS, we've tested nearly every LiDAR available, and the Alistair LiDAR have the lowest failure rate. If you want to build the technology of the future, Alistair is able to meet that challenge. There's a good bit of propaganda. 
Um, and this video is a little closer to home. These guys are doing um, um, literal, so nearshore um, coastal bathymetry um, in, or around France, I should say. TV show. Um, the, what, what I really liked about that is that they've just got this LIDAR getting completely smashed by seawater like all the time. It's um, pretty, pretty rugged stuff. Um, all right. Um, so I'm not, I don't want to bore you with all of that. And we've only got a minute left. Um, this is pretty cool. Um, Sandvik. I don't know if you guys know Sandvik. I like my Sandvik garden tools. Um, I like my gardening generally. Um, they're using uh, Alster LiDAR to do autonomous underground mining and basically, you know, um, I think we've heard it said in previous um, uh, conferences, you know, the best way to manage um, risk in mining is to get the people out of the way. The people are the problem, they create the problems, they create the danger, move them out of the way and let the machines do the work underground and put the people in the control centres above the ground. Lisa, you might have more to say about that at some point. Yep, uh, intelligent transport systems. So this is the whole deconflicting pedestrian and cyclist movements and monitoring um, what exactly is happening and understanding contextual understanding of management of traffic. Um, and I've got one minute left, and I want to finish early, so I'm just going to stop there. Thanks very much. Oh yeah, entirely. Well, well, you know, I've still got to sit there and put the foot on the, the brake to push the button to start with. Do you have to turn the wheel? Yeah, well, that, that's interesting because it, 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 um, it steers in the middle of the lane. If, if I go off the middle of the lane, it'll pull me back into it. Really? No, it's a combination of different technologies. So this is your Subaru Forester. Yeah, yeah it's using um, photogrammetry. So it's got two camera sensors up in front of and above the uh, rear view mirror. And it's doing real-time photogrammetry for understanding what's happening in front of the vehicle. And that's informing the adaptive cruise control and object avoidance. And then it will be using, I think, sonar um, uh, I think it's either sonar or radar um, sensors like around the side and the back of the vehicle to understand what's, you know, um, adjacent to you to give you the alerts in your blind spots and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, guys. Oh, wait. Uh oh, from the expert. <laughs> I know, what you're, I know what you're getting at. This is the 800 metres above ground level stuff. Um, I don't have any um, internal advice that that is a use case that's being contemplated. So I, my, my understanding is no at this point in time. And that's because of the laser technology or the optics? Yeah, a combination of laser optics and the uh, ranging error associated with it. Yep, yeah. Yep.
Um, no, not that I'm aware of. And in fact, Auster, so you see they're already looking at, you know, ganging up multiple sensors on individual bits of hardware. And obviously, I would imagine Plus, who are currently building their first thousand truck fleet and should have that done by the end of this calendar year, um, will we'll have considered that because they will have multiple trucks operating in one logistics centre. Yeah. I don't know, but um, Ouster do have a really amazing blog page, and on that blog page they've got uh, the... I can't remember the name of the street. It's this famous curvy street in uh, San Francisco. Lombard, that's it, Lombard Street. And, and so they've got a scan on Lombard Street, and in that blog they talk about, you know... Um, because the um, Ouster LiDAR sensors actually all have an IMU built into them as well, and so that helps to, you know, um, join data. So it's one thing to have it sitting on a tripod and spraying out from a fixed location, but when you've got this agile, you know, platform that's propagating this LiDAR sensor and it, it's moving and it's, you know, rolling and pitching and all of that at the same time, then to tie all of that data together, you need a really good um, trajectory data set, like the old SBET files, um, to um, compensate and allow all of that data to be stitched together into a single cohesive you know, three-dimensional um, data set. So they use kind of like a consumer-grade IMU. It's probably, not, it's probably more advanced than consumer-grade, but it's not exactly Honeywell Aerospace or Aplanix hardware. Um, and then they talk about the benefits of um, like basically sticking three ousters on the roof of your car when you do an MTLS instead of one, and having three of them there and the three IMUs um, allows you to really tighten up the trajectory file. So I don't think they're going to be interfering with each other, even though they will have a huge amount of overlap. Yeah. Anything else? Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. All righty. It's morning tea time.